I'm the whistler. And I know many things where I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Tonight, it's the whistler's strange story, The Big Prison. To John Emerson, it was more than a nightmare. The sound, the images flashing across the black background of his mind were too real, too terrifying. At first, nothing was clear to him, but gradually he seemed to be back in Ketchikan, Alaska, his mind going over and over that first chance meeting with Willard Crofton. Pompous, jovial, boring Willard Crofton. There was a long, tiresome trip to Crofton's lodge. The days, the weeks wasted looking for game that just wasn't there. And always Crofton, with his foolish jokes and his guns, shoving another highball into your hand, and another. Then suddenly in a rush it all comes back to you, like acid in nitroglycerin. The memory of those last wild moments at the lodge explodes in your mind. All right, Crofton, all right. I've had enough. Do you hear me? No, see here, Emerson. I think you up at catch a can and brought you here because I thought you'd be good company. But if you think I'm going to pay you a passage all the way back to the States... That's exactly what I think. I've listened to your silly chatter for a month. Now I'm going to get out of Alaska, even if I have... Oh, no, no, no. No, no, John, look, look. You, you've been drinking too much. You, your fingerprints will be all over that gun. You... John, put it down. Put the gun down. <laughs> Then it's gone, in a red flash. The nightmare, the vision, the spinning, dizzy, sick feeling. You open your eyes and you know it's all real. You discover yourself lying, fully clothed, on a bed in a hotel room, with the morning sun streaming in the window. But before complete panic can overtake you, you're stopped by the sound of voices. Real words from real people coming in over the open fence. I tell you, Joe... The telegram's addressed to Willard Crofton. And I'm telling you, he's still asleep. I'm not going to wake him up until it's almost time for his train. But the wires marked deliver personal, and we're supposed now to... Now, deliver... look, I'll deliver it personally when he wakes up. What difference does it make? Don't ask me. I don't make the rules. You're sure it's Mr. Crofton in there? Sure it is. I've never seen the guy, but he came in drunk late last night. Well, I got an idea. Let's, let's look at the register. No, it won't do any good. He was too stiff to hold a pen in his hand. Uh, something really had the guy going. Huh. You know, maybe to be sure, I ought to go on out to that guy's hunting lodge, and if this is the wrong guy out here... Look, look, why make the trip for nothing? He bought his car. Go out and check the registration. Then if it is Crofton, leave the wire with me, and I'll deliver it for you as soon as he wakes up. You're on your feet now, John, piecing it all together, weaving dizzily over to the dresser, wincing at what you see in the mirror. Then your eyes drop down and you grow tense at what you see. Greenbacks all over the place. Crofton's wallet, his papers, his railroad and steamer ticket. Well, it's Crofton's car, all right, Joe. Yeah, didn't I tell you? I just leave the rest to me. Son of a gun, I don't know that... The telegram still says deliver personal to Willard Crofton. Okay. All right, be a sap if you want to. Go on, go on. Make the trip all the way out to the lodge. You cling to the edge of the dresser as for the first time the full realization hits you. If that messenger goes out to the lodge, you know what he'll find, John. Crofton dead on the floor. And a dozen wide open clues. Pointing straight at you. You begin to think clearly and rapidly. What you need is time. Time to get out of Alaska before the body is discovered. And there's one way to do it. One way that Crofton's Lodge might go undisturbed until spring. You tense yourself and take the plunge. Uh, someone out there looking for Crofton? Oh, uh, uh, 
Yes. Well, I'm Crofton. What is it? Oh, a uh, telegram for you, Mr. Crofton. Mark, uh, deliver personal. Okay, just a minute. Well? Oh, oh yeah. Here's your telegram, sir. Uh, we, uh, we're sorry to disturb you, sir, but we weren't sure you were Crofton. Who else would I be? Well, I don't know, sir. It, it, oh, it's, it's 8.15, Mr. Crofton. Your train leaves at 9 sharp, you know. Yeah. Don't worry. I'll be on that train. It's new. It's big. It's different. It's exciting. Betty, what in the world are you doing? I'm practicing to be a radio announcer. I was just talking about our new radio show. Well, honey, uh, do it this way, huh? Attention, everyone. Listen to the Betty Grable, Harry James show, now being heard on the station. Okay, Mr. James, you said that real good. I'll be glad to listen. Thank you, Miss Grable. May I join you? Certainly, and that invitation goes for all of our friends. As a defender of freedom, America must continue to build up its armed strength, and the United States Army is rapidly expanding. With this expansion, more nurses are needed. If you are a registered nurse, volunteer for service with the Army Nurse Corps. There are immediate assignments in this country and overseas, and only qualified graduate nurses can fill them. Write or wire the Surgeon General, United States Army, Washington 25, D.C. And now, back to The Whistler. only now that the full force of a picture, the thing so many men have felt about the North in years gone by. For the guilty, Alaska is a gigantic prison where the only real avenue of escape to the South, the railroad to Skagway, the sea lanes beyond, all carefully policed by watchful eyes. You have only one hope now to escape this Alaskan prison before Willard Crofton's body with all the evidence pointing to you is discovered. Going back to cover up would be too dangerous. And that means five terrible days traveling on Crofton's ticket. One by train to Skagway, four by boat to Vancouver. Five days in a trap that may be sprung at any moment. garage man is outside uh, about the car. Oh, well, is it ready? Uh, ready? To be put up for the winter. Oh, oh, yes. Tell him to go ahead. Ah, good. Oh, your baggage is in the lobby. Oh, yes. Uh, have it taken to the station, will you? Oh, here you are. Uh, yeah. Thank you. How long till train time? Oh, let's see, uh, about 30 minutes. Well, I, I'm a little tired. I guess I'll wait here till just before the train leaves. Yeah. Uh, how about some breakfast? No, I'm afraid there's not that much time. We're going to have lunch at Bennett anyway. I, I'll wait till then. Well, yeah, it's up to you. But knowing the White Pass and Yukon Railroad like I do, I'd never leave White Horse with an empty stomach. And somehow, by a miracle, it works, John. A last-minute dash to the train. The creaky ride to Car Cross, then lunch at Bennett, and the dizzy, winding descent to the little village of Skagway, nestled under their glacier at the water's edge. You tell yourself the worst is over. Then there's no reason for anyone to go to Crofton's cabin. No reason why the body won't lie there, undisturbed until spring, six long months away. You begin to relax in Skagway as you walk up to the steamship clerk to check your reservation. Well, now, let me see. Let's see your ticket, sir. When does the boat leave? Tonight at 7. Uh, oh, well, Crofton. Huh? You remember me, Jim Carroll. I talked to you on the way up. You came in about three weeks ago, didn't you? Uh, yeah. But, uh, could be... <laughs> yeah. 
uh, with another fella. Or, uh... Oh, see, now, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I guess it was your pal I talked to. Yeah, it must have been. <laughs> say, by the way, where is he? Uh, he, he decided to stay up there for a while. Oh, well, now, that's funny. He told me he was due back in the States in a few weeks. Well, the guy can change his mind, can't he? Oh, sure he Picked can. Picked up the tickets, will you? <laughs> oh, see. I know why he's staying up there. Why, sure I do. What do you mean? Your partner, Mr. Crofton. Didn't he let you know? My partner? Yeah, William. I got a reservation wire here. He's due next Monday on the Nora. Going up to the lodge for a fling at the hunting racket himself. <laughs> oh, that. Well, yeah, he sent me a wire about that. <laughs> when, when does he get here? On Monday. He'll be up at your lodge by Tuesday night. Uh, you uh, think you might change your plans, Mr. Crofton? Uh, no, 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 no. One of us has to be on the job. What time do I get down to Vancouver? Well, leaving tonight, you'll be there Monday around 5 in the afternoon. Okay, fix up the ticket. <laughs> See, that's a funny one, isn't it? That is a funny one. You and your partner will pass each other on the way. <laughs> the ships that pass in the night. Fix up the ticket, will you? <laughs> I think. I'm sorry. I am in a hurry. Oh. Yeah, Mr. Crop. <laughs> I'll fix it for you. Well, John, it's going to be a race now. It's a grim kind of a race. As you move southward on the Louise to Vancouver and Freedom, as Crofton's partner comes north on the Princess Nora over the same route, bound for that cabin, and the awful discovery that awaits him there. And if that happens before you reach Vancouver, John, if he arrives while you're still impersonating the dead man, one quick radiogram, and it'll be all over. And you, John, the murderer of Willard Crofton, will be apprehended in a matter of minutes on a ship at sea with no escape. Another part of it's over, John. The vessel moves out into Lynn Canal. The lights of Skagway recede into the night. You leave your cabin, manage to have dinner alone, and then slip back out to the deck, find a chair, and lean back to rest for the first time in more than a day. You're tired now, terribly tired, and you're thankful for the darkness and the soothing slap of the water against the sides of the ship. And then... Mr. Crofton, mind if I sit down? I, uh, no. No, no, no. Uh, that's the Crofton of Crofton Williams, isn't it? I saw your name on the passenger list. Quite a surprise. Oh? Yes, I've dealt with you people for some time now. Nearly 15 years. Well, uh, I'm Dr. Prentice. I'll ask your medical mission. Oh, uh, it's a real pleasure, sir. My, I could tell you some stories about the things your medical supplies have done for us up here. Saved a lot of lives, Crofton. Fine. Oh, you, you better hurry if you want dinner. That's the last call. I don't believe I'll eat anything, thanks. Haven't been feeling too well. Oh, seasick? No, no. Touch of cold, I think. Light temperature. If I took my own advice, I'd be in my stateroom. You going to Vancouver? Yes. I have to get back to give my partner a chance for a vacation. Good. Vacation. Well, that's what I need. You know, I really better turn in. <coughs> Will you excuse me? Of course, Doctor. It's nice to talk to you. Thanks. It was a pleasure meeting you at last after doing business all these years. Uh, I'll try to make dinner with you, Cross. Perhaps tomorrow evening. Fine, Doctor, fine. Good night. But fortunately, the doctor keeps to his cabin for the next few days. And you're alone now at the rail of the Princess Louise as she slides into the dock at Ketchikan. 
Oh, Stuart. Stuart? Yes, sir. How long do we tie up here and catch the camp? Eh, about an hour. I think I'll go ashore and stroll around a bit. Everybody does. Both boat loads. Who? Yes, sir. That's the Princess Nora there at the dock. Nora? That's right. She's headed right back where we came from. Anyone aboard you know? You've got plenty of time to see them. Uh, no. No, no, there isn't. Anyway, I've changed my mind. I'm going to stay aboard. The hour in Ketchikan seems like ten years, John. It's ironic, isn't it? You and Williams in the same town. Williams on his way north, where he'll find his partner murdered. You on your way south to find freedom with a slim slice of time. Only a few hours still tipping the balance in your face. Then finally the tension eases a little, and you stand at the stern rail of the Princess Louise. Watch the Nora back slowly out of the harbor and steam away toward the north. Then... It's strange, isn't it? Huh? Uh, watching a boat move away like that gives you a lost, empty feeling. Oh, I didn't see him. It's like being separated from someone in, in a crowd. You wonder if you'll ever see them again. Yes, it is something like that. And that boat going where this one came from. Well, what's it like there? In Segway, I mean. Oh, didn't you just come aboard? Yes, this is the farthest north I've been. Well, it's much the same. So not as many people. You live there? No, Vancouver. Oh. Seattle. You're a native there? No, no, I don't. I... I come from a large family. We have relatives in Vancouver, too. Uh, you know anybody named Lockwood? Lockwood? Uh, as I say, I come from a large family. Oh, you going inside? Yes, excuse me, it's the wind. My, my throat is dangerous. You're trembling inside as you hurry away, aren't you, John? Yes, because it suddenly came home to you. This girl from Seattle. She's someone you know. Someone who knows you. You're thankful for the darkness of the ship's rail. But now, in some pretense, you've got to remain in your stateroom for the next two days until the boat reaches Vancouver. Stuart, if you don't mind, I'd like my breakfast served here in my stateroom this morning. Hey, Roger, right, sir. Are you feeling all right? Nothing serious. Well, if you'd like the ship's doctor... No, sir. no. I, I tell you, it's nothing serious. I'm just playing safe. Yes, sir. I'll bring you breakfast right away. <laughs> Yes? Your breakfast. Oh, come on in. Put it right there. And... Oh, Dr. Prentice. I told the steward it wasn't necessary. It was my idea, Mr. Crofton. See here, Doctor, I'm not seriously ill. There's no need now, for you to... Oh, Mr. Crofton, that's what I'm here for. <laughs> it's just like all the rest of them. Here now, let me take your pulse. Might as well get your temperature, too. <laughs> A sense of anger mixes with fear as the doctor stands over you. Above all, you can't have him meddling, telling you to get out on deck. As he turns away for a moment, you remember his first conversation. Something about a touch of cold, a slight temperature. Your eye strikes the pot of hot coffee on the tray right next to your bed. And an idea comes to you that almost makes you laugh out loud. It's so simple, isn't it, John? To take the thermometer from your mouth. Dip it for an instant in the coffee and put it back before the doctor turns. And you know in advance what he'll say. Now, uh, Mr. Crofton, if you let me take a look. Hmm. 102. Mr. Crofton, I'd say you should stay right in bed for a while. Nothing serious? I don't think so. However, I'm glad I checked. <laughs> Sorry I was short with you, doctor. And don't you worry. I'll stay right here till we dock. Defense bonds are my favorite way of saving. They make it easy to store up the nest egg for emergencies and to help make your future dreams come true. And today, defense bonds do something else. They help to make America financially stronger for our national defense. That's why it's important for all of us to buy defense bonds regularly. And the best way to buy them is the automatic way.
through payroll savings where you work or the bond a month plan where you bank. Friends, let me urge you to do your full share for America's defense by buying defense bonds. There's no finer investment in the world. Thank you, Lee Wiley. Folks, I want you to meet Betty Grable. Hello. Now I want you to meet Harry James. Hi. Now that we've met, both of us... Mr. and Mrs. Harry James, that is. Yeah. Both of us hope you're listening to our radio show that is now being heard on the station. And if you're not, please tune us in for a sample, won't you? You know, we have fun with our music and chatter, and we think you'll have fun, too. We'll be expecting you. Bye now. And now, back to The Whistler. <laughs> Well, John, it's almost over. The nightmare from which you've never really awakened. It's a real frightening thing, this delicate schedule you've been forced to follow. Just 12 hours from now, the body of Willard Crofton will be discovered at his hunting lodge near Whitehorse. And only moments later, the wires will be crackling with orders for your arrest as a murderer. But that's 12 hours from now, John. And long before that, you'll be off the ship miles out of Vancouver on your way to a safe hiding place. Yes, John, Alaska was a big prison, but you've escaped. In just a few minutes, you'll walk down the gangplank on schedule, safe and free. Yes, Stuart, come in. My baggage is on. Oh, doctor. Look, it was nice of you to come again, but I told the steward I was feeling much better. I really... He told me. It's the same. I thought I'd better take that temperature of yours again. But really, Doctor. I... Oh, come now. It'll only take a moment. Well, I'll tell you Under that Under I... the tongue. I... That's it. Mouth shut. <laughs> Sometimes I think that's the best part of being a doctor. Telling people to keep their mouths shut and making them like it. <laughs> oh, better get that pulse, too. Mm -hmm. Not bad at all. A little rapid, but that could be nerves. All right, let's have a look at that thermometer. Look, Doctor, I was trying to tell you this is all foolishness. I, I'm feeling fine. Yeah. But what's the matter? Nothing. Quite the contrary. Your temperature's normal again. And I don't mind telling you I'm greatly relieved. Well, I just... Relieved? That's right. Of course, with no temperature, you're free to go anywhere you like aboard the ship. Aboard the Wait a minute. What are you getting at? Well, you really did it with that fever of yours. Made me suspicious. I checked the number of the other passengers. Why? What about them? Too bad, but I'm afraid one of them picked up a case of smallpox somewhere in Alaska. Might have slipped past me if it hadn't been for you. Now we'll all be held in quarantine. Remain on the ship for the next 48 hours. Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman as the Whistler, Lou Merrill, Mary Lansing, Pat McGeehan, Jack Moyles, Howard McNear, and Vic Perrin. The Whistler, directed by Gordon T. Hughes, with music by Wilbur Hatch, is produced by Joel Malone and transmitted overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler was entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarities of names or resemblances to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Harry? Yes, Betty? How many people are listening to our new radio show on this station? You mean the uh, Betty Grable, Harry James show? Well, what else, dear? Well, I hope everyone's listening to the music and to the fun and to us. Well, just in case we've missed anyone, here's a special invitation from Betty Grable... And Harry James. ...to listen to our radio show every time it's on the air over the same radio station. was transcribed from the CBS radio network.